Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Russ, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you today. Amber O'Hearn is a returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out her first appearance on episode 90 of Boundless Body Radio, which is one of our most talked about episodes of all time. Canadian-born Amber O'Hearn is a data scientist by profession with a background in mathematics, computer science, linguistics, and psychology. After moving to the U.S., she began experimenting with different forms of diet in order to retain her health and balance her mental state. She has been studying and experimenting with ketogenic diets since 1997. She has been writing prolifically and speaking about her experience and expertise on stages all over the world and on many shows like ours. Amber has been eating a carnivorous diet for over a decade and lives on the other side of the hill of us in Boulder, Colorado. Amber O'Hearn, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you back to Balanced Body Radio. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be back. I had a great Absolutely. time last time. Well, so did we. It was an absolute honor to finally be able to talk to you. You're somebody we followed for a very, very long time, and it was so cool to follow you. I love following you on social media as well. It looks like you're getting outside and getting lots of walks. Um, but recently, it seems like your house has been transformed into um, a sound studio, a music studio of some kind. What is going on in your house? <laughs> you're talking about the pictures I posted with the drums and the... Yes. <laughs> yeah, we have a bit of a... a love of music in this house and lots of, we're filling up that room with lots of things to experiment with it looked like it was totally full of all kinds of different <laughs> instruments you have the drums we saw people playing guitar is it your kids that play uh yeah i i play a little bit i mostly sing and i only dabble in uh things that require manual dexterity uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we also have friends that come by and jam and yeah, it's a really important part of my life, actually. Oh, I love that. Um, I think you posted um, a, a gig not too long ago. Um, I, I believe it was your kiddos that were playing. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So um, both of my uh, younger children are involved in music projects right now, and they play out around Boulder. And I personally, I used to sing backup vocals for a local punk band here, but it kind of fell apart during COVID and we haven't gotten it back together yet. Dang, well, I can't wait for that one. Let me know when you guys get back together. I'll make that eight hour <laughs> drive edgy. across the mountains. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. I love it. We'll get to know the other side of you. It's great. Well, Ember, um, you know, we talked last time about your story. I think it would be nice to kind of just review for the listener, kind of you know, the things that you've gone through in your life as far as diet, why you decided to start investigating, you know, low carbohydrate and ketogenic diets at the time that you did, which is way earlier than when most of us even had a clue that that was a, a, an option. Yeah, well, I mean, low carb diets have kind of gone in and out of fashion for a while back um, with starting with, well, not even starting with, but Atkins was a really big um, movement, I, I guess, in the, in the 70s and 80s yeah that's right a lot of people forget there was kind of two waves of it it was the 70s when he was talking about it which was when like, kind of before like people were really afraid of fat i think most people think atkins and they think like the like the late 90s when everybody was just eating chicken breast and they've lost tons of weight but they were absolutely miserable <laughs> yeah no, he was unapologetically in favor of very rich fatty foods and and sold the diet as such like you can have good health and you can eat this <laughs> and and we backed off of that I think even through so the Atkins books brand uh, went through um, a kind of an evolution to I think the latest book that had the name Atkins diet on it was after his death and it was the most vegetable heavy version of the diet that had ever come out and I think wow. that I think that that was basically in order to kind of reconcile the really bad reputation that it had started to get. People were saying things like, oh yeah, you can lose weight, but you're gonna have a heart attack, right? <laughs> and and so they wanted to create this uh, idea, a perfectly true idea that you can have a low carb diet that's chock full of vegetables. It's still gonna be high fat, but it doesn't have to be low in vegetables. But on the other hand, it can be. <laughs> <laughs> And so that was the version that you had kind of, it, it, that's where you got your information when you decided to check out low carbohydrate? Actually, the first book that I really resonated with, it was kind of a timing thing. I, I had heard of low carb 
back in uh, the early 90s, and I thought it was insane. I didn't really even look into it. I didn't give it serious consideration because the whole idea seemed preposterous to me because I had grown up with, my, my household was, was mainly vegetarian, and I had grown up, you know, as a teenager in the 80s with, with this whole grain-based pyramid, and it just, it just was too far away from anything that I thought that I knew to, to really give serious consideration to. But when, after many years, that wasn't working for me and I was gaining weight and I wasn't successfully losing weight by doubling down on this kind of vegetarianism, um, then I was more open to seeing what other kinds of ideas were out there. And I had that seed planted from hearing about it and I guess what I heard about was probably Atkins variations, but what I found when I went to the bookstore in 1997 was Mike Eads's book, Protein Power. And I just loved that book and um, it was full of references. It was full of all kinds of interesting ideas. And I, and I really started deep diving into those references. It was the first time that a book that I was reading sent me to the library because I was so fascinated by what was going on in it. <laughs> Wow. No, that's awesome. It's so interesting to look back at so many people, the giants in the space and low carbohydrate space that can trace their kind of lineage to, to that book and to Atkins and, and those, you know, those giants that really paved the way for the rest of us and helped us, you know, kind of understand this stuff from the beginning was pretty amazing. So I know you transitioned you know, onto low carb. You, you, you were quite successful with it for a while, but there was a time when it stopped working for you in the way that you wanted to do it. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So over time, I had gained weight. I mean, more specifically, I went through a couple of pregnancies, and I gained a lot of weight with those pregnancies, but then it didn't come back off after. And in fact, I continued to gain. It started to feel like it was out of control, and I didn't know what was going on. I, I you know, I looked and looked at the literature and everything that I could find supported my idea that low carbohydrate diets should should be reducing my weight and yet it didn't seem to be helping and and at that time i started hearing about um, paleo diets which i also <laughs> i have this i guess i have this history of not um not taking things seriously until until i've heard them enough times but um when i first started hearing about paleo diets i thought oh well it's just a reduction in grains it's just like low carb by proxy <laughs> um and and i don't think that's that's totally it now because when I found zero carb or carnivore plant-free diets, there's a lot of crossover between potential mechanisms of things that you're eliminating um, in the paleo idea versus the, the carnivore idea. And I had to start looking at that a lot more seriously as well. Um, but talking about giants, um, if, if you don't mind, I would like to mention that the people that my, my lineage for, for carnivore comes through, well, initially I found this group called Zeroing In on Health, which was run by Charles Washington and some other people were also administrators like Dana Spencer Shute, who's still highly involved in that community. And um, so that was where I was, but those people in turn were influenced by many people, but two major figures that were influential in the carnivore sphere were, first of all, Wilhelmer Stephenson, the explorer, who had in the early part of the 20th century had been exploring, spent a lot of time in the Arctic. I think six or seven years he spent with Inuit peoples, and he, he came back from those adventures saying that when he finally went ahead and embraced their diet that was plant-free, he actually felt really, really well and ended up having to um, kind of to put that to the test because people didn't believe him about it. And so he did um, experiments in, um, in, in showing that in a metabolic ward and follow-up at home. And so that was very influential. And the other figure is Ausley Stanley, uh, otherwise known as the bear, who was the sound man for the Grateful Dead. So that's what he's most famous for. His second most famous thing was that he was a huge manufacturer and distributor of LSD. <laughs> uh, but the third thing that's a little bit more obscure that maybe most people don't know about him is that he was, he was on this 
plant-free diet for all of his adult life, and I don't know why he decided to do that exactly, but he was really important for us in the beginning because we had we had our own experience of feeling great, and we had the low-carb literature explaining to us why we don't necessarily need to fear fat, but to just have some person who you could look at and say, well, he turned out okay. That was really, I think, really important for the community at the time. Yeah, absolutely. I remember hearing about that, about him in particular. And it looks like we've just established your Mount Rushmore of nutrition. We've got all the, <laughs> the major heads carbon stone. That's great. I love that. Um, so what did you notice in particular when you started to investigate the carnivore diet and you started to try it for yourself? What things got better for you? What things improved for you that maybe was, you know, the, the expected things, but also some surprising things? Yeah, well, at the time, I was just really desperate to lose weight, and it was kind of a vanity thing, but also we know that being very overweight is not healthy, and I didn't know what was going on, and it was a, it was a rough time for me because I had been, I'd been diagnosed with depression. Um, in fact, I'd been re-diagnosed from an early diagnosis of depression to type 2 bipolar disorder, so I was taking meds for that. I had all that going on. I had a very busy family life. And I, I didn't look and feel the way that I wanted to. And so I was trying all kinds of things. I was just searching and searching for an answer. And I don't know how I came across it, but I came across that, that uh, forum that I mentioned, ZIOH, which stood, stood for Zeroing In on Health, which is interesting to me because health was always always there as the motivation, but but I was there for weight loss. <laughs> like, I'm not going to lie. And, and I saw all these anecdotes of people who had a background kind of like me in many ways. Either they, they just didn't get where they wanted to get to with low carb, they got so far and no farther, or they had regained and they were having success by eliminating plants from the diet. And so I thought, well, if it worked for them, maybe it'll work for me, so maybe I should try it. And it took me a long time to work up to it. I, I kind of read for about a month and, and made a plan. And I thought I could try it for three weeks. And and then if it didn't help, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't need to do it anymore. And I think that's actually a good strategy for people because if you think, oh, change your diet to this, then you think, oh my God, I'm never gonna eat X or Y again. And it's very, it it's hard to get yourself on board with something like that. but what I did and what worked for me is just tell myself, this is time limited and I can be totally all in for that time limited period. Yeah, totally agree. That's how I did it. Same thing, 30 days and like day 31, it's like, well, this is awesome. So and keep going. <laughs> right, right. So within that three weeks, I, I started losing weight super rapidly. So that was really good um, positive feedback that, that helped keep me going. And my mood started improving. Now, of course, if I'm losing weight, <laughs> obviously that's going to make me feel happy and, you know, happy. You almost could define happiness as the sense of moving toward the things that you want in life. That's what makes us happy. So, so I didn't conclude, oh, my mood disorder is, is better. But I couldn't ignore the fact that I felt great and and that my that my mood was stable, like it wasn't this really high and low. Um, and the other thing about something like bipolar disorder is that it it's known to have these time dilated swings. So just feeling good for a few weeks doesn't really mean anything in the the context of of a a disorder that puts you in swings over a time frame of years. But nonetheless, I felt great. The three weeks, just like you said, the three weeks came up and I was there was no way I was stopping. <laughs> <laughs> um, now I've forgotten uh, what your question was. <laughs> no, you answered it perfectly. It's so it's so interesting to hear everybody's different experience with carnivore. And even even as we were talking last year, I remember specifically asking you like how strict you were. And you were just saying, like, I'm not willing to give up how I feel every single day for, you know, something else. And I remember at the time I was kind of more moderate with my carnivore diet and I was bringing more things in. And I had an episode a few months later where I started eating a pie and I couldn't stop eating this pie. And I ate the whole thing way, way more than I wanted to eat. And my anxiety was awful 
awful, awful, awful. And that was it for me. Like, I'm not going down that road ever again because it's not worth giving up the feeling of feeling great. And it's, it's interesting. Like some people use carnivore as a tool temporarily, and then they can go back and have more plant foods and other people need to do it long-term. And I think both are really awesome. I think it's valuable for either one. And so I would love to first address with you what, what are we missing by eating animal products? Is there anything missing? I, you're the best person to ask because you wrote a paper about this, I believe in 2018. Um, it, surely if we decide to eat steak and ground beef or eggs or whatever, we're missing out on this giant plethora of other things and the rainbow and all this other stuff that we can find at the grocery store. What are we missing if we decide to try a stricter ketogenic diet? It's I'm sorry, a carnivore diet, excuse me. Yeah, that's okay. It's a really, it turns out to be a really complicated question because I mean, the, the the first pass that you can do is say, okay, we know what the human nutrient needs are, so let's like match up and see what what we're missing. And you can get, a, I think, a good first pass idea from that. Um, but what happens if you look at clinical evidence? So for example, we talked about Stephenson and wh what he did was, um, to prove <laughs> that he would be okay is he he and his co-explorer uh, Karsten Anderson did did this study in conjunction with Bellevue Hospital and the first part of it was in a metabolic ward and the second part was just follow-ups where they were eating this plant-free diet and they were monitored for how their health was and at the end of one year it was a one year long thing they they were evaluated and they were found not to have any deficiencies. So that's that right there makes you stop and, and wonder what's going on. Now, they did eat some organs. It's hard to tell from the writings how much organ meat they ate. And organ meat is definitely a lot um, higher in nutrients that a carnivore diet might look like it's missing from an RDA perspective. But on the other hand, um, Stephenson himself has said repeatedly that organs were not a big part of the Inuit diet, that they, they, they shared them with the dogs. And you can imagine this kind of picture, you know, dogs have been with us for a long, long time. Um, <laughs> dogs are definitely paleo. <laughs> and dogs have a much higher protein tolerance than humans do. And so the idea that maybe we, we would give them the leaner parts, including the organs, is, is at least um, defensible from that kind of thinking. But anyway, um, so that, that's one clue that maybe deficiencies aren't going to develop, even if it looks like they're going to on paper. And that, that is echoed in the experiences a lot of, of a lot of people in the community. But so how do you resolve that dilemma? Do we worry, like one one thing you might think of is, um, well, maybe you've got a deficiency, but it's so low that the consequences of it aren't going to be felt until much later. And that's the same kind of problem that you see in veganism, right? So B12 in particular is a really important nutrient for the brain, but B12 deficiency m might take a really long time to show up in a way that, you, that is going to, um, you're going to notice and really say there's something deeply wrong going on here. And I can't, I can't say that for sure that there aren't some nutrients where something like that is going on with carnivore. But on the other hand, I started looking at the RDAs and I realized that there's that there are a lot of assumptions going on here. When you talk about the recommended daily allowances, what you're looking at is studies where in the context of a grain-based diet that we're all on basically here in this society and across the western world if you take away one nutrient how how long does it take for a problem to develop and there's a lot going on there because nutrients are interdependent and there are many ways in which they're interdependent so for example there are direct absorption problems that happen on a grain-based diet. Grains have phytates in them, and that interferes with the absorption of minerals, among other things. So zinc, for example, is the kind of canonical nutrient that I think of when I think about the interference of grains. So there's a, there's a study, I can't remember the name of who it was, but uh, they were feeding people 
oysters and then monitoring the level of zinc in their blood. And when they fed them just oysters by themselves, the zinc level went way up and you could see it in the graph. And when, But when they fed it with corn tortillas at the same time, the levels just stayed on the floor. They didn't ever go up. So, and that's that's a direct result of the absorption interference. So, Maybe. yeah. So you think, okay, you've got a carnivore diet. The RDAs are all based on these assumptions of these other components of the diet that aren't happening in the carnivore context. And there there are many different ways that there can be interferences from absorption to metabolism. Um, so it made me realize that we kind of have to step back and we're, we're almost have to go to back to the drawing board. We know that there are certain nutrients that are absolutely critical for humans. And I'm not gonna say, oh, well, on a carnivore diet, you don't need zinc, <laughs> but the levels may be quite different. And so I think that the, the first pass analysis of just comparing it to a chart is going to lead to a lot of um, mistakes. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. One of my favorite ones to really look at is vitamin C. I get asked about this all the time. And I'm, you know, fortunate enough to be able to see you through Zoom. Doesn't look like you have scurvy. I, I <laughs> would imagine at this point, um, you know, like the old pirates might have scurvy, whatever. Like, like we think we need a certain amount of vitamin C and we only think the vitamin C comes from citrus fruits or in, in the plant kingdom. And that may not be true. Is that right? Yeah, there's a really interesting history of that. So vitamins were only discovered just over a century ago and when when vitamins started being isolated it solved a whole bunch of problems so we had this model of disease and we had learned about germs but then there were some diseases that didn't have didn't seem to have anything to do with germs <laughs> and we found out that they had to do with very specific nutrients and that's how the whole idea of finding all these um, levels of vitamins came about and vitamin c was the one that was that we realized was associated with scurvy um, but before we knew about vitamin c itself um, we knew about scurvy and we also knew that eating fresh meat cured it so <laughs> that's really interesting right so arctic explorers are the ones that would run into it because they had to live on rations and rations are don't have a good level of vitamin c normally because vitamin c tends to be lost through heat and drying mm -hmm. and so yes if you if you have lemons or limes that that will solve that problem but it was also really well known that if you eat meat fresh meat that would also solve the problem but i think that when when the whole um epidemic of learning about vitamins came along and vitamin C deprivation was the thing that caused scurvy, the idea about meat sort of fell into obscurity because it doesn't really make sense. Meat has some vitamin C. That's a whole other point of confusion because the USDA database lists it as having zero and that's actually technically incorrect. Uh, they list, they have a little like a footnote saying, oh, we didn't measure it. <laughs> um, but we just don't, it's it's a small amount and, and we don't expect it to be a good source. It's not really an excellent source of vitamin C, but it's there. Um, but the reason that it's preventing scurvy seems to be um, beyond the level of vitamin C that's in it. So it creates this sort of mystery. Um, people who are going on carnivore diets these days are not seeing scurvy turn up except in some unusual cases. So back at on the ZOH forum, there were a couple of people who were eating pemmican only who developed scurvy. And um, that there's some contention around whether it, it's the drying process completely destroys it or if there has to be heat involved for it to be completely destroyed. But whatever whatever the reason, they weren't eating fresh meat and it didn't it didn't solve the problem. And it seems like people who are on carnivore diets, maybe they get enough if you look at the numbers and how much they're eating, it looks like they can, but it seems really kind of close. Yeah. <laughs> which which should make people uncomfortable. And something that I came across when I was researching about scurvy was the role of carnitine. So carnitine, as the name suggests, is something that's really high in meat. It 
technically, I think asparagus and maybe a few other sources that are plants have a bit of carnitine, but it's mostly something you would find in meat. And carnitine is one of the, vitamin C has several roles. One of them is it, it's an antioxidant. One of them that's really well known is that it's an enzyme that's, or a coenzyme that's needed in the formation of collagen. So we think about scurvy and we think of someone who's bruising and not recovering, or, or you get to the level where their gums are receded and their teeth are maybe in danger of falling out. And that's because of, you, you need the collagen for tissue formation and maintenance. But the other thing that it's involved in making is carnitine. And the main use that I know of for carnitine in the body is is to metabolize fatty acids. To get fat into the mitochondria to burn, you need carnitine to shuttle it in. It's kind of a rate limiter. And so the first actual symptom of scurvy is getting really, really tired. <laughs> and I think that's because you don't have enough vitamin C to support the generation of carnitine that you need to generate energy. And so I think that the, the carnitine sparing aspect of eating meat is actually the most important reason why it is an anti-scorbutic because you give someone meat and they immediately start being relieved of, of the, the worst symptoms, which are the fatigue symptoms. And then that leaves enough vitamin C left over to be able to take over things like co the collagen formation. And so, um, <laughs> vitamin C is really, it's the, it was determined to be a vitamin because scurvy develops if you don't have it, but actually carnitine is almost as essential, um, or it's, it, <laughs> it's a balancer that lowers the need for vitamin C if you're getting enough. That's really well explained. I really appreciate that. Um, I was just asked this like five minutes before getting on, somebody get, wrote me a Facebook message. And so I'm curious to know when, if somebody is choosing an animal-based diet or a carnivore diet, must they be on grass-fed meat? And also we've already mentioned organs. To, to get the maximum nutrition, do you have to consume any amount of organs? Okay, so in terms of grass-fed and grain-fed, nutritionally, there really isn't that much difference. Um, I didn't need grass-fed to get my results, thank goodness, because at the time that I was doing that, it was not something that I would have been able to afford to do solely. Um, and I know many, many people who are not doing grass-fed who are getting lots of benefits. There may be some people who um, need that extra boost because grass-fed is going to have slightly more omega-3 fatty acids and maybe some other differences in nutritional profile. But because they're a ruminant animal, they, they detoxify and generate their tissues in such a way that um, what they're being fed doesn't have a a very large difference on, on the end product, except in terms of fat. So when you feed grains, so all, all cattle are grass fed initially, and then we're talking about what happens at the end of their life. And with the conventionally raised beef, they're fattened by feeding a higher degree of grains at the end. And so that makes a kind of more, um, more appealing product for our palate, um, and it does change a, a little bit of the nutritional composition, but not to not to a really important degree. For me, I think grass-fed becomes something that um, I value more as time goes on because I realize how dependent I am on that animal and I want it to have the very best life that it can have. And in some cases, not all, <laughs> the grass-fed life turns out to be something that is more more something that I want to see in the animal that I depend on. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, so for organs, um, it it seems like no, <laughs> just based on anecdotally, the people in the community that are not eating high levels of organs don't seem to need them, although. If you have anything going on in your body that's being an extra drain on certain nutrients, a boost of, nu of extra nutrition, either from a supplement or from an organ which is higher in those nutrients, could be a boon to you. Um, and so I'm not saying that there couldn't be a benefit, but 
what I am saying is that a lot of people are are able to maintain a really healthy body w without those added organs. And I think we have to take that seriously in light of the knowledge that we don't know what all the interactions are. And the other thing that I would really want to say about organs is when we say organs here in the States, what we mean is liver, <laughs> right? Nobody's eating thymus or brain, like not nobody. I've eaten thymus, I've eaten, um, I've eaten brain, I really like brain, but what we have the most access to here in terms of organs is liver, and liver is a powerhouse. It's really chock full of lots and lots of nutrients, but it's also so full of nutrients that you, if you're eating a lot of it, you're actually running the danger of getting too much of certain nutrients, especially vitamin A, maybe copper, and, and who knows what else. What I have found and what other people that I've talked to have found is that the palate seems to actually guide you. Like there's the whole thing about not liking the taste of liver in the first place. And I don't know about that because that could have to do with a sort of uh, enculturated revulsion. But if you like liver generally, what I'm finding is I'll get a craving for it and I'll eat a bunch of it and it tastes really, really good. And then over the course of a couple of days, it starts not being appealing at all. I just don't want it. And I really think that that's the body saying, okay, we're topped up now, you don't need any more. And, and months can go by before I will want it again. That's a great answer. I think that's the best thing we can do is just really pay attention to our bodies and really tune that in over time. And I think we can we can recognize those cues when we need them. I never could tell a difference when I was taking, you know, liver supplements or when I was eating raw liver myself when I was when I was it was it was very difficult for me to tell whether it made any benefit at all. But I really appreciate those answers. I want to make sure we're leaving plenty of time for your latest research. I'm so excited to talk to you about that. But before we do, just generally speaking, the, the big 30,000 foot you plants have um phyto phytochemicals and they have um antioxidants and they have all of these vitamins and minerals and chemicals that are resveratrol like all of these things that are just so awesome and amazing and across the board we all just know ubiquitously that they're amazing if we eat the carnivore diet what are we missing out on the plant world as far as all of those things right so so a lot of plant foods are very rich in vitamins and minerals that we definitely need. And so if we eat them, they can be a source of that. And it, and they get that's what they get a lot of publicity for. Uh, and it makes it sound like, oh, meat doesn't have anything. Meat is for protein and everything else comes from plants. But that's, that's really not the case. Meat already does have a, a beautiful um, profile of vitamins and minerals. Um, so the only things that plants have that meat doesn't have would be, like you said, phytochemicals and fiber. And I think that I think that would be all of them. So fiber does not seem to be necessary. There are some studies that show an association between higher fiber intake and better health, but all of those studies are enmeshed in this carbohydrate based diet in which it looks like the the fiber is actually a marker for eating less processed foods. So if, if, you're, if you're eating a high carb diet either way, then the one that has higher fiber is likely to be one in which the sources of carbohydrate are very different from the one in which the sources of carbohydrate don't have fiber with them. Um, but if you look at you know, colon health, for example, there's this great myth that you, you need to have plant fiber in order to have a proper bowel movement. But that really makes no sense if you, if you look at for example, other animals in the animal kingdom, some of them are carnivorous animals and they all have perfectly working colons. <laughs> um, it's definitely, we're, we don't, our colons aren't so different in terms of the tissue and their, their health needs that, that they could go without fiber and we couldn't. There's, there's really no, um, no real argument there as far as I can see. And things like uh, the, the products of fiber, uh, which are generated by bacteria that eat them, like butyrate, which is considered very important, can actually still be generated from uh, what you would call animal fiber. So the, the parts of the animal that we're eating that don't get fully digested, like, like uh, uh, collagen, for example, 
you can still generate those. And, and also other, there are these balances of bacterial populations. Some bacteria actually generate butyrate. <laughs> so um, I, don't, I don't think any of those arguments really carry weight once you look at them closely. Yeah, as to I phyto, love that. As to phytochemicals, um, it's a little more complicated because <laughs> there's this, um, We've come a long way in understanding uh, what phytochemicals do and don't do. And there was this long period where we, you know, the the antioxidant theory of aging and disease uh, was very popular. So there was this belief that so <laughs> a lot of diseases have in common this association with runaway oxidation in the body, where where there's oxidative stress, which means there's more, more reactive oxygen species um, than can be dealt with in the body. And so the way to get rid of that, that excess oxidation is with antioxidants. And that's correct, but, <laughs> but it, it's an association and it's, it turns out that it's not really a, probably a causal association, more likely what happens is that as you get into a disease state, your mitochondria and all of your um, systems that should be dealing with oxidation normally and keeping it in balance are not doing that. Um, and so you've got excess oxidation. So then the question becomes, when you eat these plant phytochemicals, does that get rid of the oxidation? Well, there are two types of phytochemicals that have an antioxidation property, and they used to be kind of glommed together. And I think in some places, some people still do that. But one of them really is an antioxidant, like vitamin C that we talked about, and, and beta carotene. Those are antioxidants. And when you take them, that will have, if, if you take them in high doses, that will actually reduce oxidation in the body, which could be good, I guess, if you're in this state of excess oxidation. But it's not necessarily good, because oxidation is is actually not necessarily bad. Um, <laughs> I have this graphic uh, often in scientific papers when they're showing reactive oxygen species, shortened ROS, ROS, it shows it in this like star. Um, <laughs> and it always makes me think of the pal with, with Batman um, <laughs> because um, so it's this like explosive thing. But, I, but Batman is also this character where there's some ambiguity about whether he's a villain or a hero. And I think the same thing could be said about reactive oxygen species, because we think of them as being bad because of this whole oxidative stress thing. But they're actually deeply important and critical for all of the functioning of the body, because they act as a signal. Yes, we don't want them to get too much. They have to be kept in balance. But that signal is really, really important. So for example, there have been studies where vitamin C if you give vitamin C in high doses to exercisers, the adaptation to the exercise doesn't occur in the way that you would want it to. And that's thought to be because the signal of the oxidation has been curtailed. So, so that's a case where, yes, a plant might be providing something that might be good, but it actually also might be bad. And <laughs> you need a kind of context of if your body's already handling all of its oxidation in, in a good manner, adding extra oxidation on top might not be a good idea. Yeah, that's such a great point. I love that you did the Batman analogy. I love that from your presentation. <laughs> so great. Um, and if you don't mind, I would love to talk about that presentation. And I just want to point out that when I become interested in a topic or in something, I will, you know, queue up some podcasts. I'll listen to them as I'm walking around my neighborhood and I watch a video or two. And for me, that'll kind of do it. And I'll, I'll learn about that thing. For you, you go back to college. <laughs> I actually Holy literally smokes. did <laughs> for this one because um, wow. <laughs> sleep has been something that I've been interested in a really long for a really long time um, before I even found carnivore I had started deep diving into sleep because I was really interested in this uh, wacky idea that you might be able to sleep less uh, if you do it more frequently around the clock so there is this whole idea of polyphasic sleeping and the Uberman schedule uh, sort of fallen out of favor, but it was a really big fad in around 2006, and I was super interested in it. 
um, partly because I was overwhelmed with parenting and wanting to also continue studying and doing all the things that I wanted to do. And I just, it was the first time in my life after having children that I felt like I couldn't do it all. <laughs> um, so I thought maybe this would be the key. And it never, I was never able to get that together. But in the course of learning about that, I learned that short sleep can be a treatment for depression, but it's a it's a miserable kind of treatment because it's completely unsustainable. I mean, people say keto is unsustainable, but sleep deprivation is definitely unsustainable. Um, so I had this in the back of my mind for a long time, and it was something I always wanted to return to. And then a couple, uh, I guess in in 2019, no, 2020, I was, I had started, something got me thinking about it again. And, and I thought, I really want to find out what is the state of the art in sleep research today. So I did, I looked up um, the course catalog at CU Boulder, and I got myself enrolled in a, in a graduate level course in sleep physiology and learned as much as I can with now the knowledge about ketogenic diets. So the whole time I was thinking, you know, what are the interactions that are going on here and what, how can I apply this knowledge to something I've developed and another expertise in? Amazing. I love, <laughs> that's awesome. I love the divergence of these two things. I think anecdotally, a lot of us have had different experiences with sleep and I, I've heard a lot, you know, I, I went carnivore and now I need less sleep than I did before. So like I've got better energy. Um, I'm, I'm so curious to learn what you learned in school. What have we learned about sleep? Because honestly, I think most people still just think sleep is the off switch not really much is going on. We're just kind of chilled out and we're going to rest for the next day, but there's a lot that's going on. And I'm, I'm wondering what things you've learned about what sleep even is and what it does. Yeah. Well, it, it's both completely, completely known that that's not true, but at the same time, we don't, we only really have theories about what sleep is. So um, in order to know that we need sleep, the, the, the real reason we know that we need sleep is because of what happens if you don't get it. <laughs> um, so from, you can take that and make inferences about what it's actually doing. So sleep is is homeostatically controlled. We know that because the longer you go, the, the more irresistible the urge is to fall asleep. And in fact, at a certain point, you can't not fall asleep, right? So there's something that's going on that's saying, that's, that's like pushing us towards sleep and, um, what what actually what it actually does is is kind of complex and there are many different ideas about it um but there are there are two main different things that happen during sleep there's slow wave sleep and there's REM sleep and they have different roles and slow wave sleep is is what's considered deep sleep where um you're <laughs> it's really kind of fascinating to to see what's going on at the neuronal level, because what happens is you have, it, normally there's all kinds of neuronal firing going on throughout the day. When you go into slow wave sleep, all of your neurons turn off at the same time in a coordinated way, in a pulsing way. Um, and then some of them come back on, but they, but they keep doing this pulsing of turning off. And that pulsing creates a wave that, it, that can be picked up on, um, by electrodes and so that's what characterizes deep sleep and it turns out that the that these um periods of deep sleep are mostly concentrated at the beginning of the night and they have intensity that is uh, proportional to like the size of that wave and it's more intense at the beginning of the night and um, then there are like all these ideas about why would the brain need to do that? <laughs> um, and then the other component, main component of sleep is REM sleep, which is associated more with dreaming. And um, you have, the brain is actually very active. It used to be called paradoxical sleep because of that. The brain is really, really active, but the connection between your brain and, and your motor neurons gets turned off uh, presumably so you don't act out whatever you're doing while you're dreaming. You, dreaming isn't exclusively the realm of REM, but it's highly associated with it. And and the so these two kinds of stages basically alternate and um, 
and yeah, scientists are trying to figure out what what those different things do. One one idea that I think is particularly compelling um, and well evidenced is that during the slow wave sleep part, neurons get pruned, and so the the brain only has so much room, and it's really a highly energy intensive organ to use. And so if you're learning all these things, you're making all these connections, you're growing all this neuronal weight. <laughs> it becomes unsustainable. And so the idea is that during slow wave sleep, a whole bunch of stuff gets pruned away and then uh, REM helps build back and strengthen the connections that survive. Wow, I had no idea, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, really cool. Wow, that's super cool. So what things did you end up learning about the relationship between diet and sleep? I, I, I will ask the question that you already addressed in your presentation, which I think all of us just think, yeah, when I eat a lot of turkey at Thanksgiving, I get really tired because of the trip to town. And it seems like it's a little bit more complicated than that, isn't it? Yeah, well, there's long been this um, association noticed between the amount of energy that you eat and the duration that you sleep. So, for example, um, people who are under, going, undergoing lab-induced weight gain, their sleep duration will increase. And likewise, people who are undergoing weight loss, their sleep will decrease. And then um, people with anorexia in particular have really um, short sleep. They can't, it, it, it seems to mostly affect REM actually because they seem to be wide awake most of the last third of the night. Uh, and when people with anorexia, anorexia are recovering, their sleep duration also recovers. Uh, it used to be thought that the association between energy intake there was noticed an association between energy intake and sleep duration as well, and it used to be thought to be only from carbohydrates, but further study revealed that fat intake also does that. So, so that's really interesting, um, but duration itself is a little bit deceptive because of the intensity of slow wave sleep that I mentioned. So you can have slow, well, first of all, there could be, um, time in bed where you're not really asleep a lot of the time and you're not getting any of these sleep stages you're waking often even if you don't necessarily notice that you're waking you could have really poor sleep efficiency um, with, with it still looking like the duration is essentially the same but even if your sleep is fairly efficient in terms of not very many wakings or not a lot of time spent awake there there's this um, concept of intensity of this of the slow wave activity, and the more the more intense your your slow wave activity is, the more it dissipates this um, sleep need that we talked that sleep drive that we talked about. So you get more and more tired throughout the day, and the more slow wave sleep activity you have, the quicker that that drive drops off. So if you had um, you could imagine having like say three periods of slow wave sleep but the, the brain waves are only getting so high and it doesn't dissipate that sleep drive as much as if the first one was really high, which it tends to be. But the depth of that intensity is correlated with how much energy your brain was using. So there are a variety of different things actually that can drive up the energy in the brain and give you a higher intensity of slow wave sleep. So heating the body will do it, exercise will do it, meditation will do it. Um, but it turns out that ketogenic diets also seem to increase slow wave sleep and slow wave activity in general. And because of that, it seems to me that a ketogenic diet should be able to shorten your sleep duration, not because, um, not because you're getting less sleep in a bad way, but actually because your sleep is becoming more intense and therefore is taking care of the needs of slow wave sleep in a shorter period of time. Wow. And that, again, that matches up with a lot of the anecdote I've heard from people who start this, you know, way of life lifestyle and, and yeah, they need, le they seem to need less sleep and have better energy um, than they did before. And that's consistent with your findings? Yes, absolutely. 
Wow. And you also mentioned a few other things that can help. You mentioned heating the body. Um, so we just added a sauna like two or three weeks ago. And I absolutely love it, even though it's the middle of summer here in Salt Lake City, like it's plenty hot. <laughs> I don't need to get hotter. But I, I noticed for sure that like if I used it during the day, it was great. But if I use it right before bed, I have amazing sleep. And I just thought this was like a body temperature thing. I'm heating up my body. So my body's going to compensate. I'll sleep a little bit cooler. It, it, are there other things going on there? And, and again, is that consistent with your findings? Yeah, that, there could be two components going on. So the heating of the body itself, at least in some of the research I looked at, it seems to create this more energy in the brain, which then would correlate to a higher intensity of the slow wave activity. But in addition to that, there may be a, a kind of vasodilation effect because which, which would affect not the sleep intensity or duration necessarily, but your sleep onset time. Because one of the things that happens when you're going to sleep is that yeah, your your body cools down in, or, in pre preparation for sleep. And the way that it does that is by um, increasing uh, blood flow to the limbs in order to release heat so your body can cool down very quickly. And you can kind of trick your body into thinking that it's <laughs> going to sleep by warming up your limbs, uh, because that sensation of that temperature differential is a signal that it's time to go to sleep. And so that can shorten your, your, your time from hitting the pillow and, and falling asleep. So you could have been getting both of those effects. Wow, that is super interesting. In your talk, you also bring up satiety, which I think is fabulous. You have a wonderful definition of this. And I, I will say, if you, if, if you don't mind, if you could share the definition that you like the most about satiety, we went to a Brazilian steakhouse this weekend and mm. like bought nonstop. I'm, I kid you not, for like an hour. They were way overstaffed. The food was amazing. We got there early. Every 20 to 30 seconds, it seemed like there was a new platter of food coming around. And we were like nonstop for, for a full hour. Another piece of pecan, you're like, oh, okay, yes, yes, please. <laughs> and and, and you, you get to this it, the food is so tasty and then it becomes a little bit more neutral and then you almost have this like weird aversion to it like and and I've, I've kind of tried to help people understand the difference between satiety and fullness in that way and and I, I love the definition that you have and can you can you share that definition with us and can you also tell us how, what that has to do with sleep, sleep quality yeah the definition is from Nicolaitis who was a researcher in sleep and in satiety and um I know I don't know it necessarily by heart, but it's something like uh, satiation is the progression from uh, the thought of food being appealing to the thought of food becoming um, actually disgusting <laughs> or unappealing, let's say, unappealing. Um, and I think that that really makes sense. Like we're always trying to um, find markers for things physiologically in the body. Like we've noticed that say, uh, leptin, when leptin goes up, satiation or satiety goes up, or when ghrelin goes up, it's associated with hunger. But then sometimes we kind of <laughs> replace the the territory with the map and we're saying, oh, ghrelin means hunger. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean that. And, and it's only true insofar as it lines up with the actual thing we're trying to measure, which is, do I want more food right now or not? <laughs> uh, so yeah, that, that's the definition that I really liked. I love that. Gets, yeah, it gets to what we really care about. Yeah, eating a kale salad, you can definitely get full, but you're, you're not satiated in that same way. You're gonna be very hungry in two or three hours. Right. Yeah. So that's satiety. How does that relate to sleep quality? Right. So we talked about um, energy in the brain. Um, without getting too technical, there are some results of energy use, including the uh, neurochemical adenosine and including reactive oxygen species again, where the more that they build up, the more is associated with uh, sleep drive building up, and they may actually be the factors that are leading to sleepiness. Both of those things, reactive oxygen species and adenosine, are the direct result of energy use. Uh, adenosine is a byproduct of ATP generation, and so is, so is reactive, so are reactive oxygen species. And so in, in the whole body, if you're using energy, um, there can be 
byproducts that get into the bloodstream that are noticed by the brain. But the brain actually also has in the hypothalamus a kind of um, simulator, if you will, where <laughs> the bloodstream is going by and whatever is happening in the hypothalamus can reflect what it can be inferred to be happening in the rest of the body. So if you have a bloodstream that's flush with energy, then your cells are going to use that and your metabolic rate is going to go up and these byproducts are going to build up. And that is, that's directly one of the ways in which our brain determines that we've had enough. And, but it's also <laughs> directly related to the signals that ultimately generate sleepiness. And so that ties back to having eaten more energy, um, resulting in, in more sleep duration, but also just as a, as a signal for when it's time to sleep. The more energy that you've used, the more it seems that sleep drive kicks in. Wow. And one yeah, no, thing, that's so interesting. Go ahead. One thing that's really interesting about that is you would expect if a ketogenic diet ramps up um, adenosine in the brain, which it does, and uh, energy use in the brain, which it appears to, um, you would expect that a ketogenic diet would make you more tired. It doesn't seem to be the case, and that's where another um, another magical neurochemical comes in, which is orexin. Orexin also has this cool um, overlay between sleep and appetite. So it's called orexin. You might recognize the the root from anorexia, which means no appetite. Orexin is an appetite regulator. And so the more, the higher orexin is in the brain, the more hungry you should be. Um, and a ketogenic diet, oddly enough, raises orexin at the same time as it raises adenosine. And these, these should have opposite effects. So the more adenosine you have, the sleepier and more satiety you should have. And the higher orexin is, the hungrier and more wakeful you should be. <laughs> uh, but it seems to be that because it raises them both and because they have mutual inhibition, that what it looks like to me is that a ketogenic diet allows you to have higher adenosine in the body without the same level of sleepiness that you would have if you just had um, adenosine without the opposing orexin. Fascinating. That's so fascinating. So what would, what would be some of the key takeaways practically that you might recommend for somebody to implement some of these things? Does this affect your meal timing, your meal frequency? Should you always eat, you know, a certain few hours before bed? How, how, did, how has all of this research kind of changed your way of thinking about that? Well, that's a good question. I'm not always very practically minded, so I'm glad that you put it to me that way. <laughs> um, one thing, um, so a lot of people report that on a ketogenic diet, they sleep less, but it's in a good way, right? Like we talked about where you feel like you actually need less, you slept less time, but you still feel refreshed. But other people have reported that they're sleeping less and they're actually feeling like they're experiencing something more akin to insomnia and it's not restful. And so what I would say is if you're in that position, you should look at your energy intake. Maybe you're not eating enough fat uh, in particular uh, to, to generate the energy to allow you to sleep. Um, so that's one practical takeaway. Um, you mentioned about timing. There's some really interesting circadian effects that we didn't get into at all, but um, insulin, insulin resistance is higher. Um, I'm gonna get this backwards. <laughs> uh, uh, insulin sensitivity is higher in the morning. And so, um, there's some argument for eating uh, most of your meals toward the beginning of the day, even though you definitely want to make sure that you're at a point of satiety when, when you go to bed. Yeah, that's great. Wow. I love that. So I'm going to take that to say that I can continue having my giant cast iron skillet full of meat around 6 or 7 p.m. I can keep taking my sauna around 8, 8.30 and go to bed at 9, and that's a, that's a good night. 
Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me too. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation as was our last one. We really appreciate you taking the time to study all of this stuff in such depth, go, going literally back to school, <laughs> to get some of your information and then to come around and, and present to it. So we're, we're so honored that you had come on our show and, and talk to us about some of these things. Where would you like people to go to find you and connect with you in your work? Thank you. It is an honor to be here too. And if people want to connect with me, the the place that I am most uh, easy to find is on Twitter, where my handle is Keto Carnivore, and I'm I usually will see notifications, and you can ask me anything, and I'll either answer it or or uh, try to find somewhere that someone else can answer it for you. That's great. You're like the nicest person on Twitter by far. <laughs> I have my moments, but I try my best. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I'm a little more well-behaved than I was in the past, but um, yeah, Twitter is not normally the very nice place that I that I go. <laughs> so that's great. We're so glad you're there. That's thank awesome. You. Amber O'Hearn, thank you again so very much for all of um, your research and everything that you do. And thank you for taking the time to be on our show today. We really appreciate you. Thank you very much. Likewise. Absolutely. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.